Thank you for gathering in the MCC. Um, so just like Victoria said, Professor Robinson, we're going to be grounding y'all in the kind of history of the space as well as giving a land acknowledgement. So again, my name is Mateo. I'm an intern here at the MCC. Um, I work in the programming and the kind of cross-cultural student development area of the, the work that we do here. Um, and this is uh, my fellow intern. Hi, my name is Amara. I'm also an intern here. I'm working with the art committee. Um, and yeah, we first wanted to offer a brief land acknowledgement, and we thank the Native American Student Development for drafting the statement. We recognize that Berkeley sits on the territory of the Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenos, Ohlone, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm in Indigenous sovereignty and we work to hold the University of California Berkeley more accountable to the needs of American Indian and Indigenous peoples. And, you know, we also understand this university right, as a land grab institution with real no real investment in their actions to committing to Indigenous sovereignty and defending Indigenous rights. So it's our responsibility to like be on this land acknowledgement, really offer a call to action um, to engage in the educational and political work for indigenous peoples and the rights to sovereignty around the world as they are all connected, um, including in Palestine. And we just want to offer a few of our MCC Multicultural Community Center offerings as well. We have an altar in the back that we encourage folks to engage with, highlight, um, you know, honoring our martyrs, and then also a special book collection um, on Palestine that can be found in our library. Um, folks are, feel, are able to access this um, during MCC open hours and you know, ask the interns about you know, other things that we have, um, materials that we have to engage with. And then lastly, we encourage folks to get involved with um, organizations such as Best for Palestine um, and really get involved in grassroots organizations that are uplifting their own people's rights to the Cool, thank you so much for that that land acknowledgement and um, a call to action to, to actually materialize our solidarity with these movements. Um, so now just a little kind of brief history of the space. Can you raise your hands if y'all have been to the MCC before? Okay, that's a good number. Great, great. So who knows what TWLF stands for? Okay, cool. So less hands. So quick crash course of TWLF. The Third World Liberation Front is the movement that essentially established ethnic studies and black studies in 1969 when primarily black students came and organized together at the Black Student Union at SF State, they said, we, wanted to, we want this institution to teach our stories. We want to be able to intellectually think about our histories, our people's histories. And so that's where those studies came from. It wasn't ever kind of given, willingly created by the, or given by the university or created by the university. It was created by the people. And so in 1999, Students also noticed the, the fact that when Ethnic Studies was created in 1969 and established here at UC Berkeley, in 1999 there were other kind of budget cuts and kind of things happening to the, to the department that the students saw that well, that wasn't in line with the needs of the people that were teaching these histories or even the students that were learning these histories and listening to the people, the professors in the department being taught. And so in 1999, some of the students organized a hunger strike asking for the kind of reinvestment in the ethnic studies department as well as um, a multicultural space and so that's where the MCC was kind of born its first iterations we've had different places on campus we've had different sizes we've had different amounts of resources allocated to us but it's really through the kind of continued stewarding of the space with such intention of our core values that you can read on that wall um, like being student-led primarily is like the most important one to us as well as being rooted in anti-oppression social justice work. Um, so that's where this space came from. And so within the offerings that we have, just as Amara said about the Palestinian literature and the altar we have, um, we also have like safer sex products, menstrual health products, a food pantry, testing supplies, and a library that's not connected to the UC Berkeley library system. So it's really for the people, by the people, we still primarily support student populations but we also ask folks in the community just to come by and host events and hang out with us. So yeah, thank you for being here. I'm excited to hear 
from y'all. I'm going to pass it back to Victoria. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, MCC. It's great to be here. Yeah. So, um, welcome to the many different constituencies that are with us today. I want to quickly shout out and say hello to the Bay Area educators who are developing the Ethnic Studies curriculum, um, getting ready for the rollout of the graduation requirement next year. So this event is part of the High School Ethnic Studies Initiative at UC Berkeley, which brings together the Ethnic Studies Department, the American Cultures Center, and then also the History and Social Sciences Project. Do you want to quickly stand up? Jason, the director of that project, is here. <laughs> so in rolling out such a, um, a grand ambition, the biggest curriculum advancement in the state of California in 50 years, the teachers have a lot of work to do and to get ready for. And so what we're trying to do in the initiative is to leverage what we have access to at Berkeley, which is damn good research, and try to think about how that enters the curriculum, how it might shape the design of this brand new set of courses. Um, so educators, thank you for being with us um, here and on Zoom. Also want to shout out to the Santa Clara Juvenile Hall. Colleagues, thank you for being here. It's great as always to have you in the classroom and to everybody else in the Bay who's joining us. We have about, I think, 120 people who are joining over Zoom. And then lastly, to Ethnic Studies 22AC, an introduction to abolition pedagogy and practice. So glad to see all your happy faces. Um, so I also want to shout out uh, Keith and Jason, Professor Feldman, who's the chair of the Ethnic Studies Department, Jason, who's my co-conspirator in this work, and also who made this possible today, Doug, Kuka, Clara, Krishna, Franny, and have I left anybody out? Hopefully not. So that's everybody. So we're going we're gonna to get moving. And we're going to start, so the title of today's event, Hope, Healing, and the Warrior Women Project, a discussion with my colleague, and my very long-standing friend, we're both pretty old, uh, Beth Castle. Uh, can you just flip the, yeah, to the next slide. So if you want to know more about the High School Ethnic Studies Initiative, hopefully ethnic studies students in the room might be interested in partnering with us. HSESI at berkeley.edu. Um, next slide, please, Clara. And then the next um, event in this series is on February the 28th. Um, the registration call is already open. And when Mateo talked about hunger strikers, one of our um, visitors is one of those hunger strikers in 99, Professor Jason Ferreira in the Race and Resistance Program at SF State. So he and Michael um, schultz Ockatering is going to be are going to be here thinking about anti-imperialist so solidarity. So students, you're more than welcome to join us for that. And with no further ado, we're going to quickly show you um, the trailer for the film Warrior Women. is built on the bones of our ancestors. We have our culture, we have our way of life, we have our language. What we're trying to do is retain it. Retain our right as a people to be Indian. It was truly an empowering, free time. Watching the women is amazing how they handled everything. Protecting our people and our, our children's future and fighting, being warriors in that way. The press, they just automatically gravitated to the men. And who really knew what was going on and was really running the show were the women. We were a movement of families. Being the daughter of Madonna, she definitely had a reputation of being strong. And when someone went to her for help, she did what she had to do to make a difference. However, we get the job done, you know, whatever it takes. So, the Warrior Women film, an incredible project that Beth has been the historian and director for, but as Beth will share with us, it's a very much a collaborative project. 
Um, I said that we've known each other a long time. Um, Beth and I taught uh, here at UC Berkeley together, social movements, racial politics. Beth's space was between Native American studies and ethnic studies, and then also worked with the Regional Oral Hi History Office, or what we call ROHO, here at Berkeley. Um, Beth, I think, is going to be able to share with us how the kind of extractive work that universities produce, such as a PhD, became something that was very much a collective, community-based um, oral histories project, and who's involved with that. Also, shout out Madonna, Marcy, and others who are part of the Warrior Women Project. You're probably online watching right now, thinking about your colleague. So, hi. So, today, in some ways, is the first time that this film and the Warrior Women Project that comes from the film has been in direct conversation with high school educators. So, I also want to just acknowledge and appreciate that Beth is bringing this project to the state of California at such an important time in our history. And with that said, we'd love to just show you quickly a small uh, clip from and about the Warrior Women Project. The Warrior Women Project is based on interviews with all of the women who I could get to who were Native activists, Indigenous activists in the Red Power Movement. And it spans the fishing rights at Alcatraz all over whenever it was possible, interviewing anybody who was part of this solidarity-focused transformative period. Right now we have just more and more just blossoming of the interviews that were done, a lot of them with women whose stories, um, you know, their family still needs to know. I think the Warrior Women Project, by, by focusing on women, has not only opened the eyes of the world to our reality and our power, but also ha has forged a path for others, especially young people. You know, to participate in your own recording of your own history. You know, we can't rely on the army and the, back in the past, it was the, the, the officers of the army that recorded everything. And then it was the Jesuits that came in and they did worse, you know? But they recorded everything. But now we gotta stop that thinking and we have to do it ourselves and be active. This is ongoing, this is living history and we have to be a part of it. That's what I learned from warrior women. What the goals have always been is to get, you know, research out of the academy to stop the extractive ways that we take stories all over, but do we make sure that they go back to the communities that they come from? I mean, if you guys know, let us know. Is there somewhere in this country where this history of warrior women in the American Indian movement, the Red Power movement, where is that history? And where is it being stored? and who's sharing it, and who's telling it. Through the Warrior Women Project, we can share it so that people learn our history from us. Great, so Beth and I are gonna be in conversation. I have a few questions, and we're gonna go backwards and forwards until five, and then open up for Q&A, but also if there's something kind of emerging and burning and you, you want us to, to have that moment with you um, in this conversation, just put your hand up and we'll, we'll come to you. So my first big question, Beth. Beth, thanks so much for being here. I've always wanted to be an NPR interviewer, so this is kind of fun. Um, but I wondered if you could kind of open us up with thinking, you know, why is it so important to narrate the Red Power Movement from a matrilineal perspective? the inherent powers of the, the grandmothers, I think. Um, I'm so glad to have everybody here and have a chance to talk with you today. Um, I, it's such a powerful time to, um, you know, it's always interesting when you are engaged in like the work of history and folks don't understand that history is to me, the most rapid response discipline I can imagine because we so desperately need the truth. And that's been part of this process. Um, the fact that these movements, the social movements, and I come from this, you know, this space 25, 26 years ago, 
I was doing a history PhD on women in the Black Panthers and the American Indian movement because I just wanted to understand that story and I was trying to figure out where it existed, who could I ask, should I ask, is it my, you know, whose position, all of those questions that you might ask yourself when doing a project. But with Red Power, um, part of what just was immediate is just the fact that once you start to be in conversation with people the historical truth is what leads you there. Um, and you can see that, you know, when you embrace that worldview that places um, the matriarchs, the elders, young people at the center, um, it just emerged naturally. And I think right now we're having these, you know, we're having a lot of anniversaries. And when there's an anniversary event, sometimes, you know, you get this, nat this kind of a national spotlight. So now's the time, rather than to unpack the hyper-masculine history that's sort of out there, the super Indian history that has been painted so far, um, part of the exhibit materials that you see um, around me and that you're going to see in some of these clips is the fact that we had a chance um, in this long-term 25-year collaboration that we've had with the narrators, and these are primarily grandmothers, um, but of all ages, as you'll see in all of the different clips today, you know, we work as a collective to create this history, but that's part of what happens whenever we get beyond, you know, institutional educational spaces and start learning from the narrators or the historical actors or the people who actually make up our lives. And in this case, you know, I, I'd be surprised if anybody, if you can think in your own lives, just the inherent power of the grandmothers, of the elders, of two spirit, of the people who carry those stories. And so, um, it's a, it's a great time to have to also be able to kind of skip over and not have to piece by piece undo the master narrative so that you can tell the real story. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, oh, oh, oh. I hope ethnic studies, 22 AC students are writing down some of these, right? The, your QAQC, what does it mean to dig beyond the master narrative? What does it mean to think about matrilineal relationships to social change? Why have we had such a hyper-masculine relationship to particularly narrating the American Indian movement? What does the state get to benefit from when that kind of storytelling is the storytelling of an entire people? So um, that's part of the exhibit that you've just mentioned and we're gonna kind of dig into is also anchored around one of these celeb celebratory moments, right? It is one of those half a century moments of so much social movement action and uh, you in the exhibit are really pulling around uh, the 50th anniversary of Wounded Me. And I'm wondering if you could share, you know, why was it so important to bring that relationship structure around Wounded Knee and also to share for people in the room who may not know what is Wounded Knee and why was it so important? So does Wounded Knee, I mean, just by a general head nod, have you heard of Wounded Knee in some shape or form? It has one or two major historical moments um, that are really big in 1890. Um, there was a massacre that occurred at Wounded Knee. In 1973, um, there was a 71-day occupation, and that word should really ring true. The occupation strategy for indigenous people is one of the most you know, ingenious strategies that there are when you don't have political power, you don't have economic power, but you have the power of your collective community being in a space um, often that has kind of dual interest, right? Like when you're in, you're occupying Mount Rushmore, a site for the rest of the country that is this like ode to a kind of grotesque patriotism of carving four faces in a sacred, in sacred rock. Um, the same with Alcatraz and the occupation that happens from 69 to 71. But in Wounded Knee, and I think this is what, this is what's so important that happened. So it was the 50th anniversary last year, 1973. Um, and it starts February 27th, it's called Liberation Day. Uh, and you'll see that referenced in some of the clips. Um, and part of what's so important, it's on my t-shirt, I was trying to figure out a better way of showing it, but um, not to do like my Superman move, but uh, the, there's, three, there's three women, so we created a logo that is a combination of three photographs of elder women who were protesting after the occupation of Wounded Knee occurred at some of the trials, all the political trials that were 
um, put together to try to stop movement. Okay, it wasn't because it was actual criminality involved. It was to stop the political activism. And the, the sign centrally says, we are the reason for wounded knee, put us in jail. And it was the grandmothers trying to communicate what is not known about this occupation, where the U.S. government illegally took, um, you know, swapped out the signs on a U.S. Army, um, you know, tank and put federal marshal to make it slightly more legal to turn the U.S. military against its own citizens. So they were surrounded for 71 days um, and uh, they built a community within Wounded Knee and what they were standing for was the cultural right to exist. Um, and sovereignty. So all of the language that we're building on in a global movement comes from a handful of grandmothers uh, in many ways, right? Indigenous was not a term that really came about and was used until they went to the United Nations a few years later in 1977, but it all starts in this moment at Wounded Knee. And the great thing about this too is that there's some folks in the audience or folks listening on Zoom who'll be like, well, wait, no, you need to think about this. And that's the nature of the collective work. I'm sure the second you say something definitive, you know, put it out there so we can argue and expand it and put it in conversation. But with Wounded Knee, um, you know, we just had a chance and this is what we did. We created an exhibit out of the content that began 25 years ago when I started doing a PhD dissertation and interviewed people who passed away. Um, and there's, I was the only person who um, had some part in them sharing their story. And so, you know, I, there's a clip that we can show right now that gives you a little bit of a sense of, first of all, how um, an individual dissertation can move into a space of collective collaborative work, not just with other researchers, but the fact that it's very actively shaped by um, the historical actors themselves um, who blow up this concept of how you, and this is something I met most of you will be struggling with or are already struggling with, is how do you not, um, in an institutional sense, turn the human beings that you're working with into data for your thesis? Okay. Yeah? Um, Clara, please get that clip up. Thank you. One of the things that we're always looking at how to to demonstrate it's the thing that happens like even when you go to film but like definitely in writing is that how do you show the interconnected circles how do you show the ecosystem of activism and so part of this was wanting to create these banners um, in a way first of all like being life-size is really powerful watching people come in and interact and see it um, we'll have a chance to hear from like what it was like for people from the community who didn't know their their great grandmother or grandmother was one of these people. So in writing the women's biographies, we um, in the case in the cases where they passed on, we um, described them as they described themselves in their interviews. And then where the narrators were living, um, we worked with them and their families to write the biographies. We could not find very basic information. I phoned relatives and I kind of got the run around, but um, we got we pinned down these um, dates of the women. Oh my goodness. Look at this. Oh my oh. God, there's Pat Ballinger. <gasps> oh, oh my, my God. God. Look at his toes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> he choked should be here, damn it. Alan. Oh, oh. And to me, it was a game when I would try and outrun the FBI agents and I would hide between the houses and, you know, they would lose my trail and they'd be searching around. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, the women are being honored for what they did for all of us. So powerful. I just want to ask quickly, Beth. Uh, you debuted the um, the exhibit. Was it at a high school close to Wounded Knee, or was it on Pine Ridge? Um, so. Um, Wounded Knee is a, a, a village or an area that's on the Pine Ridge Reservation. Yeah. Um, and so the what we just saw there was the actual uh, exhibit that was launched 
as part of the the Liberation Day that was is a march and an event that happens every year on February 27th that um, young people who are part of the survival school, which um, we'll talk about it in a little bit, uh, created because and the, the name of their survival school was We Will Remember Survival Group because they were committing at that time to constantly keep that historical memory alive and passing that on. So the shots, um, the shots of the exhibit itself is in the high school that's closest to Wounded Knee. The next place that it does get to go is a Pine, is Pine Ridge High School. Um, and, you know, more than anything, this is what people often assume. They're like, well, of course, local folks know this history. But part of what was so powerful is, is going to it as a high school student, going into the gym, seeing all of these exhibits around, seeing the oral history clips, watching the film, and seeing that, that their great grandma or their grandmother was one of the reasons for Wounded Knee. And not only has that not been often talked about, you know, maybe in the family, um, but it has never been included in any of the curricula. And we have even, we've just begun to see what kind of impact that might have, because it shouldn't take this long, but, um, but it does. But that's what ethnic studies as a, as a liberatory um, model for education does, is put and keep and maintain social justice at the center. Um, and that's when history, you know, that practice of history is so deep. And I think you said before when we were chatting that um, for this history to be not just done right, but done in the appropriate spirit and emotional content, it has to be within an ethnic studies, Native American studies paradigm. I don't know if you want to share any more about how that relationship feels. You talked about history flattening. It's like it could just be a, a thought of correction to the historical record but holding it within the ethnic studies paradigm does so much more for it. Well, I'm definitely a fan, 100%. I mean, I wouldn't have a place to be in the world if there wasn't the way that ethnic studies opens up the space that history flattens and erases. And, you know, some of you are studying to be historians or however you feel about it. Um, it's not a bad thing because why I wanted to do it in the first place was simply, oh my gosh, we don't, you know, I'm just like, knowing what your history is, is every human being's like building block to being part of a community and, you know, just the collective myo, you know, this is one of those places where most people are going to head nod to the basic fact of, are we not suffering in such explicit ways to like this, not only a lack of history, but that sur purposeful suppression and that erasure of history. And now we're fighting for it. Um, but it's always been the case and that's that's some of it and I still suffer from that when we sort of talk is it's like I did a degree at a place that simply did not consider what I was doing as history they're like well these are the three reasons why that's not history Elizabeth that's five angry women in a room because I wanted to study like the Combahee River Collective and black lesbian feminist organizing so instead I was like okay the Panthers and AIM might be less controversial but this isn't a place where everything I was saying was just was just other words at that time but when it can't, when it comes to um, just you know even the pra like the practice of history making and how one uses oral history, which I'm happy to talk more about because I started using that as a as a method in this degree program when they were just like, well, not only is what you're doing not history, but your method isn't valid either because people just telling their stories. Well, who's there to say that's valid, right? You know, so there's all these really explicit measures that didn't happen that long ago that simply had a full control over what got done and what was studied. Um, and, you know, I just think that, um, yeah, uh, you know, it's the kind of, I used to dream of Berkeley that, I, you know, cause I came here to finish my degree, um, even though I did it at Cambridge in England and I wanted to be here in this space, you know, when the third world liberation front resurrect, you know, it was 1999, the first time I taught and it was here. So um, it's always been a very powerful thing. And it's one of those things where it's also a space where you can be so actively involved in shifting like paradigms and providing people access um, and power when it comes to connecting to the fact that everybody's story matters and the way you can put their stories together and weave them in such a powerful way. That's a great, thank you. That's such a great segue to Think about education, sites of education, the kind of refusal that you're calling out, kind of refusal of a certain way of thinking, I mean, told to think, 
So this year, talking about anniversaries, is also the 50th an anniversary here in Oakland at the Black Panther Party Oakland Community School. It's a really important um, part of the vanguard of thinking about what the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense were trying to achieve locally in their community to free their kids from the kind of yoke that had come down through white institutional history. But part of maybe an equivalence or a connection directly anyway is the survival schools that you've already mentioned. Can you share a little bit about what survival schools were, are, and why it's so important to be connecting through first-person accounts and oral histories of those who were in the survival schools? Yeah, and I just also want to, everybody, I can feel you getting a little droopy. I'm <laughs> trying to figure out if I can do something performative, but I hurt my back, so I can't stand up and dance for you. But, um, and I can't know, dance. So yeah, good. well, um, well, we're not going to say anything. Um, the aspect here, like, here's a big deal is that, so we produced this last year and we have this amazing traveling exhibit and we want it to go places and we're trying to figure out how to do that without constantly just uh, shuffling for money and all the things that we have to do. But what happens when you do something like this in a community and they're like, okay, when are you going to come back and do more? So now we're at a stage where because of the 25 year relationships we have, and you can see the bigger team and I'm usually never up here by myself as you can see in these other spaces where we function as a team that's intergenerational cross-cultural um, and, and always possible um, but we're going to be doing in on February 27th uh, actually coming up on like the yeah 26 we're doing one day where the survival school group the we will remember survival group which is featured in the warrior women film um, which was one of a number of what they called survival schools at the time. And I think it's important just to call this out that, you know, survival was key to that, the right to survive, the right to live, the right not to be um, put through cultural genocide, the right not to um, be denied all the things that make you who you are and have that be celebrated in an educational space. Uh, was the power of survival schools. And even as I say it, I'm very open to the fact that this is a whole new area that because we're doing more collaborative research and engagement, we're going to learn a lot. Because I can't, I like for me saying exactly what it is and what it means seems rather presumptuous. But I can tell you this, when we made this film, Warrior Women, and the reason we did it is I've been working on a book project now for 25 years, realizing that I wasn't going to be an academic in a traditional sense because I was like, how can I possibly put out a book when I still don't understand the story. And so it's turned into like this lifelong process of engagement and, 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 and lots of multimedia work. So we work hard to not just record stuff, but also to do it as beautifully as we can, to find archival that'll blow your mind, right? Not the, like what it takes to find these images um, is, a, is, a, is a global hunt um, and it's so important and, um, so when we created that film, one of the big things about it is that we had the discussion of boarding schools. Now, boarding schools weren't a topic a few years ago, but it's in the news now. And there's a lot of reasons why things have changed so that we know that they were government-run sites of cultural genocide. That sounds pretty heavy, and it is. But whole generations, and so this is across so many different cultural spaces too, where you use what you call education as a, as a site for violent assimilation. And that can probably echo in a lot of different ways. Um, but in this case, the thing about the survival schools is like there was a vibrancy, unapologetic indigeneity or Indianness that thrived in it. Um, the Oakland Community School uh, started at the same time. They're having their 50th. And we're just now, like I know Ange Angela LeBlanc Ernest is a colleague of mine who's been working with Erica Huggins and other you know, great professors here as well um, to bring this history alive, and that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to interview maybe 30-some. Hopefully, if anyone's listening, you're going to come, and you'll be part of how we shape it. But we're going to try to do around, you know, however many people show up, we're going to honor and try to craft a chance for everybody to do an interview. Um, and then that's the other part, is that if you do an interview, your content, it's an ongoing process of consent. It's not about, we took a snapshot of your data, and now we're going to go do things with it. It's about, you know, how we grow and, and collaborate as we move forward. Um, I got excited again, so I don't remember if I made a point. No, I'll keep getting excited, Beth. Yeah. Right. Um, so you and I talking beforehand, too, you said 
one of the most important things about survival schools, but they didn't call themselves schools really, survival groups, was that children didn't go to a survival school and kill themselves. Mm. But in boarding schools, that, that sometimes was. Yeah, it, it sounds, I mean, one of the ways this came up is we've been planning this, and you've seen Marcella Gilbert in some of these clips. Marcella is the daughter of Madonna Thunderhawk. Madonna is one of the major, um, you know, matriarchs of the Red Power Movement. And one of the things that has always been the goal, and this is part of what happened too, just to describe it, is like any place there was an action or an occupation or an ongoing place of community and resistance, a survival school of some sort emerged. So it became a place of safety where you could look after your children or your elders, you know, and you created a space where then they would self-design their own curricula or their own learning. And it was always based on both cultural elements, but also practical things like food stamps or, you know, ways in which they were taking back and, and, and finding ways to, to educate and, and keep things connected and real. But it also just meant that you, um, you know, it was this powerful, you know, as an, as an academic or a scholar, you're, you can, I can make a lofty analysis that the survival school movement is an obvious, powerful, incredible response to a boarding school initiative, you know, to, to surviving an unrecognized genocide that, you know, the root and the, the culture stays alive in every place we've ever taken a film or shown or done anything, people want to know, well, how can we create a certain, like, how did you do it and what can we do? How can we do that? Um, and, you know, that's part of the, the reason why we keep it ongoing, because we want to give a chance for people to, to put those ideas forward and then to do it in the context of their own times. So I imagine um, everybody who's listening to this conversation too probably has this little kind of voice at the back of their heads going, um, that's a lot of historical violence. That's a lot of trauma. Um, how do I teach with that? How do I frame that? And your response to, to that, that kind of concern that I was voicing with you was that, but this is the history that saves lives. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to... I don't know, it just, yeah, I'm going to keep it real even when it goes wrong, I guess. It's just the, it's just the power, like, you know, when thinking about it, we talk about things like trauma-informed interviewing or trauma-informed, you know, basically being aware that we're bringing up and talking about sometimes in a, what could be considered kind of a cold analytical way, things that are very triggering or trauma-inducing. Um, and I think that you know, there's a lot of different ways to talk about it, but when we think about teaching it in the classroom, and again, I also think about the fact that part of what makes the Warrior Women Project different um, in the things that we try to do is that from the very beginning, we brought back what has been taught out in the curricula to the women who have been attributed to that, that work and said, what's right in here? Is this your story? And that was a really radical thing to do, and then to continue to do that so a lot of the emphasis in the way I've been educated by the many, many, many women that I have talked with over the years is the fact that, you know, allowing space for listening, demonstrating that you have done the extra homework that it takes to even, to understand the framework of someone's story, right? Um, because it does take extra work because that content is not available in often anywhere online or you'll have to search for it to be like well what are the dates that might be relevant what are the things that help me understand what this person's story would be but then the goal of getting of showing that care um and allowing people to tell their own history uh is a first is a very healing experience over time and i i say that at least from the feedback that i've gotten having worked with and interviewed people over time over many years and talked about what those feelings brought up for them, what it meant for them, and why um, for most people, the amount of challenges that they face, they would rather be in conversation with and sharing these stories um, than otherwise. But again, I'm being very conscious now and sort of very much want to also get practical about how you then take what we have here, which is a tremendous amount of content that is going to be in a publicly available archive um, that we are 
putting out there carefully because we're putting out putting it out in conversation with the people whose stories are in there, um, and that we want it to be available to educators. And this is new for us. We just started with this exhibit. We created um, one of the team members, um, Morwen Osman, who worked in particular on a um, worksheet that was for the students to use in response, and it was about their reflective responses to the exhibit. Um, and I'm very interested in learning from educators what are the things that they need so that people, like we're actually becoming sort of content providers, if you will, and, and a bridge what we can do to help that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that was a call out, educators online, if uh, you want to be in conversation with that worksheet and the new materials. One of the things that we hear Madonna Thunderhawk say in the clip already is that the talking about allyship and solidarity. And I'm wondering if we could, um, in a second, Clara, watch that clip next, and then maybe we can think about what was the philosophy for the women of all red nations? What was their philosophy of solidarity, of allyship? And then how are we inheriting that today? So maybe we'll just look at the clip first. Is that okay? The only thing I want to frame is that, so WARN, I don't know if you've heard of this group before, Women of All Red Nations, it is a group that is founded later, and in our whole, like, what comes first history model, that's not so relevant, but it is important that they have been misdated to 1974, and no one has ever corrected it, even though I'm constantly going, it's, it's important to show that fundamental respect of when this group decided they were a group. Right. But more important than that is the way in which these women kind of coalesce around this idea of matriarchy, which was not a word that would be used in any context other than some classic like anthro term, um, but has been taken on by so many people now as a as a way to not define themselves through a feminist context, but something that's more, you know, culturally relevant um, in people's lives. But this particular clip is one in which. Is, is part of the launch of the New Direction of Warrior Women project that is the methods, it's the methodological center of how we want to expand into the Solidarity in Action Archive. Thanks, Clara. Having this day, this 50th anniversary was really powerful and we started it with a meal to honor the um, allies that came to help because after Wounded Knee there was over 400 people who were all going to jail. And so there was a group of young, you know, 19, 20, 21 year old law students that were like, I want to go there and help. And so it was really awesome because they showed up and they're elders now. And they were the Wounded Knee Legal Defense Offense Committee. It was set up to provide legal help to everybody who was involved. In that. So the the folks lined up there, that was all spontaneous. This happened on February 26th, right before the Liberation Day. Those are people who were part of something called Winkledoc, which was the Wounded Knee Legal Defense Offense Committee. And this is part of the kind of landscape of the ecosystem of activism that we often don't get to see is that while you have, like what is movement building, right? Well, part of that is anytime you take action, the institutions are going to fight back with, with with some type of criminal activity or some type of legal action. So that was the big, this is a big change. This is the big shift in red power movement as well, where they're like, okay, everybody's occupied this place. And this is the thing. And this is part of, I didn't say this. It was like an explosion around the world. Everyone everywhere saw on the headlines that the Indians have occupied wounded knee. So just like Alcatraz was the, was the big explosion that said Indian people are still, and I use that term, you know, self-reference within the community, but Native American Indian people are still alive, literally. Like people were like, we didn't know, y'all didn't get killed across the country. So Alcatraz was a big deal. Wounded Knee was heard everywhere because it involved the military. And, you know, it was the first time, it was a beautiful use of the media on behalf of the Native folks who were there. Again, all by this group of, small group of, of Native women on the reservation. Who, who leveraged all of this, that it, it echoed out. But what's so incredible is hopefully what this will play and say, and I don't want to preempt Madonna's line. But it was also not meant to just be defense. Right, right. it was right. Yes. Offense was in support of the struggle, right? After Wounded Knee, American Indian Movement said, Madonna, you go and you be a li liaison with the legal committee, between the legal committee and the 
the defendants and the Indian community in Rapid City. So I said, okay, because I was a defendant, you know, and they saved me. So I went and um, stayed and I learned from them the, 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 the system. We had no, I had no idea of, of what the legal system was all about. All I knew was cops arrest you, you go to court, you go to jail. I didn't realize it was a process and, and what defense meant and they, they just walk, walked us through. And as a result, over 380 some cases, nobody went to jail. <laughs> and just as important, these people brought the state of South Dakota out of ignorance, legal ignorance, and then drug them into the modern day kicking and screaming. You know, and so it was really, really important what these people did. Mm -hmm. And I don't think our people nowadays, you know, 50 years later, what we have and we talk about is kind of like taken for granted. But 50 years ago, the state of South Dakota, the legal system was the doors were closed to us. Right. And we had no idea how to open those doors. You know, these people did it. So I thank them. I owe them my freedom. Thank you. Madonna, in response to what you said, maybe you said that people here brought you out of ignorance of the law. Well, you brought a lot of us out of ignorance to a value system that we carry deep with us today. And that's how to treat people and how to always put other people ahead of yourself. And I tell you, there was a very important value system we all learned. So it sure was a two-way street. Thank you for saying that. More about Just that them. ally, when you mentioned, if we could circle back, when you talk about like the philosophy of allyship. So before the word ally was really tossed around, that was that's what it looked like. Um, and it was such a big deal. And I think that's one of the things and why we're trying to go there now naturally, because this, this, made, this indigenous matriarchal leadership has taken us to that point to say, the vision was always, you gotta protect land, you gotta protect earth, you have to look out for community. Right, And the way in which you do that is that you find places and spaces where people can do the work that they're meant to do. And so that sort of like reciprocity that developed and that, the, that entire generation of folks, hundreds of people came out there to do this. And no other movement has that, that I can think of and jump in right now if you know it. But that's one of the things, Standing Rock, you know, the, the Standing Rock activism um, had you know, it, times change, context change, but the fact that they were able to keep everyone out of, out of prison, they got all charges dismissed, which was the most powerful thing you could say when you're like, that is what political suppression is. You're using the legal system purely to silence political activism. And they got to, they got to do that. And that story has yet to be told, right? And, they're, and we're super excited about the fact that that's what there's so much out there again that's like the ethnic studies angle on how to how to do history that matters right right so we might have time in q a to also kind of dive in a little bit more to these inherited philosophies of social movement organizing and think about water protectors almost globally but with that as a segue because i want to make sure that the students are also able to have a conversation on this on this last idea which is that um solidarity is not just within the nation state and Huey Newton called for intercommunalism, which was community solidarities, irrespective of the state, thinking about the state as an apparatus of violence itself. And at that moment of wounded knee, um, there is an incredible, um, incredible amount of global solidarity, um, which often also gets left out of the record. Um, would you like to go there quickly, or should we show the clip first and then have some conversation? Do you want to do that while there's while the students are still here? Yeah, I think so. So should we pull up the final clip? Sure. I want to take this time to um, read a statement again, and this is in the spirit of global solidarity. But this is something that was written in 1975, and it came from the Palestine Liberation Organization, and I want to share it today. Brothers and sisters, 
The saga and the agony of both Native Americans and Palestinian Arabs have much in common. Both Native Americans and Palestinians were brutally uprooted, then expelled from their homelands, and were subject to a deliberate policy of genocide undertaken in the name of the superior civilization of white Europeans. These claims of the so-called superior white civilization constitute an unabashed proclamation of colonialism and imperialism. Indian reservations incarnate the bondage which enslaves Native Americans in the same way that refugee camps exemplify the oppression of Palestinians. Both peoples have been denied their inalienable rights, including the right of self-determination in defiance of the norms of justice and freedom. On this day of solidarity, of support for the struggles for independence for Native Americans, July 5, 1975, Festival of Freedom in support of Indian treaty rights, the Palestinian people wholeheartedly joined the Native Americans in their struggle against a common enemy, U.S. imperialism. Long live the great struggles of the Native Americans. Long live the struggle of the Palestinian people. Down with U.S. imperialism, victory is ours. So I just wanted to share that today because our relationships globally are really, really important and we have more common ground than we think we do. Thank you. And Beth, I think that that's a, a piece of history that's so often not told, not brought into conversation. So what we have today as conversation has been going on for a hell of a long time. I wonder if you want to talk to the content of that conversation in particular, but also as you and I were mentioning before, like how powerfully archive and historical record are as an ethnic studies methodology to have very difficult conversations. Yeah, I mean, I sort of want to give space for that clip too, just to sit for a second, um, recognizing that, uh, yeah, we just how the how our political environment right now affects. I mean, it doesn't affect us nearly as much <laughs> based on where we are and the privilege of being alive right now. But um, I guess. I never thought all those years ago necessarily that, you know, I always thought it was a little bit of a joke that I find, you know, that history is so, you know, the very things that are so stereotyped as being lifeless and dead, as being the end of things, um, is really where, where all the action is at when you take it back and you, you know, use it to unpack and blow up the master narrative. So the fact that we're, we want to become an archive because that's the sexiest thing we can imagine right now <laughs> because there's nothing more powerful. Like, I never thought I'd hear Madonna Thunderhawks, you know, like we've done work together for so long in so many different places and spaces. Um, and, you know, there's no reason to hide the fact that, you know, part of what happens and how I this work continues is you do often become part of extended community or extended family, if not direct family. Um, and that becomes part of, like, the relationality of things and what responsibilities you have but the fact that like that that letter came up um when we were trying to think of how can we be in this public space and show our faces when you know we have to say something and how can we say something to demonstrate the fact that um you know that that piece of paper is a document that is incredibly powerful and demonstrates what the oral histories have told us for ages is that from the very beginning there's been an understanding of of the indigenous struggle and and recognizing the commonalities and that how important it is and it's something you know again and this is the part two where when we talk about red power movement we have sort of the things that made major news right and so often those are the things that we focus on but that big ecosystem of activism means that you know beyond the nation state you know, maybe using intercommunalism as a concept that, that does fit, right, but maybe it, not from the indigenous context, the language at first, is, is the fact that, you know, they travel to Lebanon and Libya and, um, you know, Cuba. They went everywhere that was basically considered a no-go zone for the, you know, as a nation state um, for the United States, and they connected. They were in Iran and, you know, and, and, you know, Sinn Féin with Ireland, one of the biggest connections Madonna ever makes along with other members is the indigeneity of the Irish people. 
you know, her experience where this isn't about what racialization is, but it's about what the connection to land is. So, um, so it's it's incredibly important, and that we're looking to make sure that these archival documents also actively become a part of the teaching tools that um, teachers can use in ways where they don't have to necessarily contend with the idea that it's it's a story. Because even though we know stories carry the history, they can still be undermined in certain ways that an archival document that's been ethically researched can. That was great. Thank you. So I want to acknowledge that there are people in the room that might have to leave for another class, but um, please do. And we're going to move to some Q&A. But before people do leave, can we just appreciate Beth, please? So we'll, we'll come um, around with a mic and take questions if people want to put a hand up. And we'll also start to get some of the questions that are probably on Zoom. Anybody want to start in the room? Charlie, you have a question? No, I'm thinking about it. You're thinking about it. Oh, good. Mateo has a, has a mic. shy. Beth doesn't bite. Well, that's not true, actually. So, yeah, I know. I know. Otherwise. Hello, hello. Uh, this is a question from Zoom. Is there a reference for the PLO quote from the documentary? It is from... Bancroft Library Archive. Yeah, it actually might be from the Bancroft Library Archive, but uh, can you put? Yeah, we actually it's literally cited. I just yeah, don't remember. There's two places where this collection was held, so if we pull it up, we'll know. There's and also a lot of these um, newsletters and content are still in people's personal possession, and that's the irony is we need to get it into an institutional possession for it to be more legitimate. And I read on the address it was PLO New York, so it was coming from a central office with PLO. I want to take this time to both Native Americans and Palestinians were yeah. source. Printed in, printed in West River Times, East River Echo. Coming from the Bancroft Library. Yeah. The social protest collection. Okay. Yeah, and that's actually up on uh, Chris, is that available? Yeah, all these links are all the all the video content is available online. Um, warriorwomen.org slash WK50. Will that get people there? And we'll have this on the resource page that um, that you'll be doing. Uh, that will be connected with this so that anything that we've shown here you can see again and access and use. Okay. I have a question here. Hi, um, do you see this material and these stories ever uh, being implemented in schools outside of California? Because I was just thinking about what that would look like in Texas and where I went to school, how that would become part of the curriculum. Did you go to school in Texas? Okay. Well, I, I just, yeah, it needs to be in all the places. So, um, I mean, California, I mean, we always joke about it, but I was like, California is great at getting out there, doing it first, usually messing it up first, right? But our, is ahead of the country. Um, I come from the Midwest, uh, for sure. And, you know, it's a different conversation uh, in different ways, and it needs a different approach. But, um Part of what, you know, the whole goal has always been what's the best way we can tell this history and it's true and it, you know, moves people and that we see it change the master narrative. And that's important because every interview I did with most of these women, their, one of their goals was I want to see history change. I want to see history change to something that is real. You know, it was so, it's like, I don't mean to, it's like, it's like, duh. Right, like that basic thing where sometimes we just forget common sense, you know, but it was so important just to be like, you know, 
we need to do these interviews so that the history is, is, is accurate and it's real and it's truthful. And so ways in which we can do it where it's taken up through K through 12 curricula, you know, common core curricula. We're working in South Dakota right now where it's illegal. You know, both Ohio, South Dakota, Florida are all part of the states who, you know, in the opposite fashion, anything that has to do with race or, you know, that you can't technically teach it. Texas makes it Texas. So. Yeah. Yeah. Texas. Yeah. It's, it's all, and it's a huge, I mean, that's part of it is like, we can make our rest of our time fighting the curricula directly. That's why I'm like, those of you who do it, I mean, my parents were K through 12 educators, you know, so it's always been that need that and who needs it the most are the front lines educators of K through 12. So absolutely. And I'm open to like ideas people have because that's, we're in the space where, you know, you just get someone who's interested and they, you know, we're, we want, we function as a network and a collective. Um, you know, so anything that has to do with this solidarity and action effort, um, that's why I'm so excited about this initiative that's being done because we want to be able to support it in any way that we can. Yeah. Charlie, did you want to ask a question? Yeah. Uh, could you elaborate more on the events that you talked about earlier? Uh, like the one on February 28th, uh, or because you said 28th, or I said 28th on the slide, then you mm -hmm. said 27th, 26th. So I just want to know what day it is. So the one, so it all, so February 27th is considered, it's called Liberation Day because that's the first day that was considered is when they drove to Wounded Knee and got surrounded by the U.S. Army um, in 1973. So every year, no matter what day it is, at least on Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota and often in some of the other areas, but especially there, there's they have Liberation Day. There's no school, and they have a Four Directions walk where they walk from Four Directions to arrive at Wounded Knee. So this year. Um, the week of February 27th is on a Tuesday, and on Monday the 26th, the Warrior Women Project will be hosting and engaging with the We Will Remember Survival Group Oral History Gathering, where we've invited and are trying to do whatever we can to get the people who are still alive, who were students at the We Will Remember Survival Group, to come and to do individual oral histories, potentially group oral histories, whatever, whatever makes sense, the weekend Prior to that, which is 24 and 25 of February, there's going to be the Dakota AIM Gathering. And the Dakota AIM Gathering is, you know, sort of one of the core groups of the American Indian Movement. They're still functional. And a lot of the elders who are the ones, and I think this is important just to have a little history moment, where in 73, and then we talked about WICLDOC, the Wounded Knee Legal Defense Offense Committee, that was founded during Wounded Knee to be as as they already saw the strategy was going to be to um to try to put everybody behind bars right and that was a way to kill movement fast faster than anything but what also happened was the elders decided to end the occupation of wounded knee after some people had been killed and it was it was tragic but the idea was already that we can't keep asking um our oppressors we can't keep asking the nation state for our own sovereignty we need to go global. We need to go to the United Nations. And that's when they founded the International Indian Treaty Council in 1974 on Standing Rock, in the same place where Standing Rock happens in 2016. The same women are the same movers and shakers, still not in the news, still not picked out. So there's this, you know, when Victoria was talking earlier, there's just this cycle this ongoing cycle that happens where it almost doesn't matter where you land, you know, there's a little advancement and it's critical and it's beautiful and it's the part of hope, but you're almost like, does it matter if I'm in 1973 or I'm in 2016, what tactics are different? But, but the reason I bring that up is 1974, they found the treaty council, 1977, for the first time ever, indigenous peoples go to the United Nations of the, of the Americas. And I say that in the quotes of just like of the Western Hemisphere. Then from 1974 to 2007 is the struggle to create the term indigenous and create the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. All of it from these handful of grannies, right? In terms of like the root of the power of it. So it, it's these powerful cycles. And, you know, each time when we were at Standing Rock, you know, and if you watch the film and 
make sure you get access to the film. It's shown here once, but it's still, it was on PBS, it got attention. But when we made some changes in the film, it was very interesting. We didn't follow the chronology when we didn't tell the sad story of boarding school first, but we went directly to stand up to the survival school story. There was a lot less interest by the PB, by the programmers that would have taken us into series that would have gotten us seen much more widely. Um, so it becomes more of a grassroots effort to get the film out there, but we still want to see the film go out there and seen quite widely because the story of that mother and daughter and what they go through carries a story for all of these others. But the point is that we never thought we'd see in our lifetimes already the amount of interest that young people have and we want people to come to these gatherings and then we want to create something new like this. This is a mini version of the exhibit, but the banners are awesome because they're like eight feet tall grandma posters that are, that are powerful to see. So that's what we're doing next. Um, you know, when I taught, the last place I taught, I took a group of students and we're the one, we did the Standing Water Protectors Community Oral History Project, which is online um, and it'll be listed as a resource as well. But those are the type of community engaged scholarship things that we want to do more of and maybe we'll be able to do that, you know, with a partnership with Berkeley or some place that might be interested um, because, because those are the things that definitely, you know, uh, just those experiences, you can't, you're changed forever when you get to go and participate in a history making. I, uh, what did you actually want to ask me? <laughs> it was about the dates. Yeah, the dates. What are the dates? Well, I think Beth unpacked the dates, but you had a follow-up yeah, like, question, Charlie. Oh, um, I guess it's more of a follow-up comment. Uh, well, yeah. obviously, thank you for teaching this uh, ethnic history and uh, people like Victoria and Jason for pushing it. Um, just from personal experience, like, I mean, I don't have the same experiences. Obviously, she did, but my mom was an ethnic studies teacher, so I got to take a Chicano course with her. Um, and, like, learning about your own people's history or, like, People like similar to you, obviously, you kind of you know that same thing, but very similar. Um, like I learned about the walkouts of uh, the Chicano of East LA walkouts, where back then you couldn't even read or talk in Spanish because you would get uh, bored in front of the classroom. And to think about that is kind of inspiring. Like when you learn about it and the movement they, and how they pushed back against it and how they made progress and just learning about that history kind of like inspires you and motivates you to like it gave me a whole motivation for education. That's what I'm doing. That's why I'm here at Berkeley, honestly. Oh. So uh, yeah. Thank you for teaching that. Thank you, Charlie. I mean, to echo what you just said is that more than one ethnic studies student has said, ethnic studies saved my life. Um, there's a hand up right at the back. Thanks, Mateo. And then do we have any more questions on Zoom that we want to collect, Doug? Hello. Uh, my question is, in the context of delivering um, what you mentioned was trauma-informed curriculum centered around ethnic studies, um, at what point uh, is an educator, I'm sure there's like never a point that an educator is like trauma-informed enough, um, but what would you consider an educator is trauma-informed, I guess, enough to be able to teach that, and how do we navigate that? Did you get that through a microphone? I did. I was just going <laughs> to open my water. <laughs> um, you know, this is something where I'd almost want to group source this too. If any, does anyone else work with trauma? informed interviewing or counseling in this space. Um, what I would say, I think, and I guess this is the part of me that is a little too influenced by really tough grandmas who are be like, suck it up, <laughs> you know, which is not what you want to say in a trauma-informed space. But the point being that like, the thing I would say, and the reason I say this is, um, did you want to add to this in particular, or? I just feel that making friends, excuse me, thank you. Thank you for your time and energy, it's beautiful. So um, I think a lot of times people who endure the trauma um, are strong enough to endure it, but the other people aren't strong enough to tell it. And it will keep repeating itself as long as those stories aren't true and authentic. And it's just something that has to be shared. And it is an ugly, gross truth, but it's the foundation that our great nation has been built on time and time again is the exploitation of indigenous people around the world. So, so what, what she said, what's your name? Shirley Matilda. Thank you. I mean, I think that's, 
that, and that's very help, helpful to frame it that way because I think what I would say, especially for educators in this, is that the like as an entry point, trauma informed, uh, well, trauma informed oral histories different than interviewing, which I think is important. Thinking about oral histories not so much as a set of of media based interviewing questions where you are trying to like build a story out of what someone's telling you, but instead you open the space for someone to share their story. And then that in the actual process needs to be really transparent, that you're listening, that you're paying attention, that your emotions don't overcome the space. I mean, I actually remember doing an interview in the oral history office here where I had some ethnic studies students who were like URAP students or undergrads. There were too many, this is where I learned a lot, where there were too many of us in the room and someone was, there were two people, two students listening. Um, and sometimes somebody wants that too. In an interview, they want other people in the space. And they want younger people. So part of it can be a conversation. But in this case, part of what happened was I actually had somebody who was a, a, survive, a genocide survivor, an Armenian genocide survivor. So there was like a lateral, a lot of things unloaded in that space that, um, that I learned from in terms of the fact that, that, that more than anything, remember that these are stories to be shared that person has the space to share whatever they need to share and you hold the space for them. And you are not, um, you're not, you are tender and you are listening, but you are not afraid to ask the questions because they have the courage to tell the story as what. And I think that that's, especially when it comes to boarding school, like sometimes people tap into emotions that come up, especially elders that you're, that may be for the first time um, and I think part of it was just wading through those spaces to see where they landed. And then the, the follow-up questions were always less about like them analyzing their own experience, but more like even asking them, like, how do you feel, you know, how, how they're feeling after it, but like, you know, giving them a chance to just, um, to direct their own story with you being able to say, you know, you know the content or the context, like if you're talking about a particular boarding school, for example, you know, like if you already know some of the things, all of these help inform it. Um, but that's something I'm really interested in seeing how people want to develop this. Like when it comes to K through 12 education, how you might use oral history, for example, I'm really interested in talking with, with, with folks about that. Um, and what I think is sort of, I don't want to, I don't want to necessarily use the word appropriate, but in a classroom, experience, you know, having students um, do oral histories with one another around maybe an event that they all may have had an experience with and not necessarily um, a life history of each other, because I think that allows, a, that that's something where um, that has more potential for being a difficult thing to manage versus the kind of responsibility of letting them share their story so that they can experience one another in a deeper fashion, but not in a way where they are interrogating each other. Yeah. Thank you. I think Jason, you have a question? I do, thank you, and thank you for joining us again. Um, so I have a question relating to ethnic studies educators as, as a group, as a community. Ethnic studies educators in California often struggle with the fact that um, they're telling the stories of people who they may not necessarily identify with, racially, ethically, gender, identity, uh, social class, etc. Um, as a documentarian, you've made a work that addresses on um, some level that disconnect because there's obviously a difference between you and the subjects of the work. Can you describe how that process was for you and perhaps share any advice um, for those grappling with similar sort of challenges about how to um, make a space for a story that may not necessarily be your story? Thank you for that. Um, and I was, uh, you know, I think I've really been thinking about this a lot over the years because of the fact that we've now been working as a collective that's changed in some shape or form for about 25 years. And I've been doing this work across expectations of difference from the beginning because I do black native, I did black native history um, 
at a very, you know, at a time when people literally just introduced the idea into the, that you could do such a thing. Um, and so it was a constant, uh, it was a constant at like element of, um, explaining myself often only in an academic context to other people, but in terms of the fact that the apprehension that a lot of people have about working outside their comfort zone or teaching stories that are not theirs. Um, I think the thing that has been most instructive to me is that it's so rarely, I, I rarely ever run into that being the feeling I've never, I've very rarely gotten any feedback that that is our people's concerns. The concerns were always whether I was prepared, I had done my homework, I had a means of demonstrating that. Um, and I think that's what I was thinking where um, for most people had been so welcoming, um, welcoming to me because there were also ways in which I indicated you know, now I try to think of like, well, what is it about me that made people feel that they could share certain things? Most of the time, it was just the fundamental fact that I would ask the question, I would put myself in that space, and that was enough for people. Um, but typically, the questions were always about, people often shared that they were most frustrated when folks came to them assuming because they were um, maybe seen as the, seen, seen racially the same or the perception, the phenotype that they were connected, that that was going to automatically mean that there was a connection that wasn't there. So it was typically about um, being able to um, connect around the common sense facts of demonstrating your interests, your respect, and your preparation for it. If that, you know, there's always more really specific examples to get into that I think, you know, that do come with this is also the responsibility can I say that I'm an educator, <laughs> you know, that all, these are all our stories and that like the question is to what degree are people, you know, is it primarily like the whiteness divide? Is it folks who are identified as white by others having a hard time teaching stories of color or what, what the defining factors of difference are and that this is where in California there's so much more, well, there is so much more going on. I think that at least that maybe it's more talked about, but that's me also casting a, and making an assumption. Yeah, I want to kind of uh, echo those interest, respect, preparation, responsibility. And if we think about those, it's actually holding over through the entire High School Ethnic Studies Initiative series. Jason, this is probably the question we can ask everybody. Thank you. Other questions in the room? Um, we have a question from Zoom, um, which is, can you talk about how teachers can design curriculum and lesson plans that teach a history through both content and methodology or content and delivery? Um, and in this case in particular, how can teachers share the history of Red Power using a pedagogical philosophy of matriarchy, like you were saying? That's a big question. Oh, man. <laughs> I'd love to know the answer to that. That would be really... Um, I don't know, that's where I just think of the, I, sometimes it seems like a cop out, but I used to not say it, but I'm just like the power of the grandma is like, do what your grandma would tell you, you know, use your comments. I, sometimes, because that was the thing, it's just like the, like it naturally comes together, the, the ethics and the methodology with the content. And I think that's, I mean, I will say that is what Warrior Women Project does. And I think it's taken a long time for us to own that. And it's one of the things we're struggling with right now is we have such a tremendous, that's why these clips are interesting because I was trying to figure out like, well, are we just going to watch me talk about myself or like what's it, what's, what's it going to look like? But trying to show us in action in like these meta narratives, because in the clips, we're looking at us taking our content to the Oral History Association annual meeting and the National Women's Studies Association annual meeting at places where it was still way too revolutionary what we were doing and it's exciting you know um you know like uh you know i was well i don't need to say that um i think that that's something we're developing um and trying not to develop it in a way where we're like trademarking it sticking our our, our flag in it but you know i'm finding it necessary to define 
collectively what when I say indigenous matriarchy simply because we've been sitting around at some of our meetings talking about oh did you see who so and so like they're using rematriation now and using this word matriarchy and you know it's a great thing but at some point we need to also be sharing sort of how these ideas got you know co-created over time and how we can um, reconnect to them because it's super important that like matriarchy isn't um, understood in the terms of like a white anthropological sense that it is power over you know in the way that we've seen patriarchy function right but that it is a response that i would say quote in madonna thunderhawk probably one of the quotes when we had a meet the matriarchs event which we have online um and it's uh where she's just like you know it's the closest word of all the words that have come out and that we've used since the kind of start of the things that we've done that echoes the kind of work of just like the natural like just the way things are um but that and it's just sort of yeah it's just it's a as you'll often just say it's just a given um so in this case i guess in a practical sense though that's the thing as a high school educator i would be super frustrated with me as well because this is a lot of airy fairy stuff right now and i no insult to aries or fairies but you know the fact that that in a practical sense we have this content this is what i'm excited about this is why i invite people and, and we'll do it for you. Like, we're not asking you to go do the work with our content. But right now, the fact that our methods have directed us constantly, that you know that what we've produced is solid. No one's going to come back and say, oh, so-and-so is upset about this in some way that's going to, like, break the pyramid or something that every step of the way it's been about this ongoing consent process and there's plenty of people who would probably go I don't know what she's doing with my stuff because because that happens things change over time right and we constant and sometimes people have also put out like really valuable you know we're trying to honor their needs 100% but they also were the historical actor who did the thing and we need to be able to name them for that um, as well at the same time but that's what I'm hoping and that's and that's part of what the project has shifted in a powerful way instead of constantly being outside kind of like knocking on patriarchy's door saying please serve and we have another we're just trying to start in the center mm -hmm. to say that this is produced from that power and that it's like we don't have to constantly explain ourselves but that we can make content then that whatever is put together is is already going to be a product of an indigenous matriarchal worldview, right? And I think that's a really good end note because what high school educators are calling for is dependability of solid research that has come from the community, that's verified by the community, that has consent of community. And so you providing us entry into this world of collective, collaborative work, of world making, feels like an incredibly generous and invitational moment for the high school ethnic studies initiative and we're out of time so if other people have questions you can uh, email them to hsesi at berkeley.edu um, and also if you're on zoom and you still have questions put them in chat we'll gather them and we can share them with beth and i think just one more round of appreciation if that's okay <laughs> beth at warriorwoman.org all complaints can go to me so thank you yeah. Thank you everybody for joining joining us today and thank you again MCC.